Hey guys, Turk here. I hope you're having a good one. Over the past month, ASUS has been rolling out some firmware updates for their ROG Ally, but they haven't really been aiming for performance. The most notable update was aiming to fix some of the SD card issues. Through ASUS's internal testing, they've seen some instances where excessive heat exposure can damage SD cards, and that makes a lot of sense, given the card's location just above one of the exhaust vents. The update implements increased fan speed in order to combat this, but it really eats into their zero distraction marketing claim if you play in turbo mode. That's good and all, but where's the performance? Just last week, ASUS dropped another firmware update. This time, they deliver a solid 30 watt plugged in turbo mode and improvements to 15 watt performance mode. As I said over on Twitter, these release notes are incredibly vague. What did they change? How is it actually fixed? And more importantly, is it really improved? I originally planned this video to be how can ASUS fix the ROG Ally's performance? But I guess ASUS beat me to the punch. Today, I want to show you what broke the Ally's performance and how ASUS plans to fix their product and highlight areas where the Ally can finally deliver the performance they advertised three months ago. In the handheld arena, we are constantly tiptoeing a fine line in terms of optimization. In its simplest form, we have two variables to optimize, performance and power consumption. Generally speaking, as you increase power consumption, your performance improves as well. However, going the other way works just as well, with less power consumption providing longer battery life. If you want to improve balance in terms of power consumption, it's a pretty straightforward problem to solve. You can get a larger battery, play less demanding games, or accept some compromises in your game settings to achieve an acceptable experience. But performance, that's a giant can of worms to tackle. But if we dig down low enough, there's another balance that handhelds have to conquer, and that's between the CPU and GPU. If you didn't know, handhelds like the ROG Ally use what is called an Accelerated Processing Unit, or APU. APUs are CPUs that contain an integrated graphics card on the chip. This sort of solution is commonplace in the industry for many years, from low-end desktop PCs all the way to our latest generation of consoles like the PlayStation 5. The APU is the heart of our handheld, but the challenge is balancing the priority between the CPU and the GPU. The processor needs a certain amount of power in order to reach a base level of functionality, but from there, it's up to the processor to dictate which components get the additional wattage. In the most simplest form, that additional power increases each component's clock speed. That additional power, in the form of clock speed, typically translates into better performance of an application. As I showed in my initial Ally video, this reveals itself very well in Shadow of the Tomb Raider. In blue, our channel favorite Steam Deck is ultimately GPU limited at 6 watts, but from there, additional power unlocks GPU performance for Valve's handheld. We see very similar behavior with the A Neo Geek, powered by AMD's 6800U Thin and Light laptop APU. At about 13 watts, the device finally starts to increase the clock speeds of the GPU, with steady GPU improvements all the way to 24 watts. But the ROG Ally, it behaves entirely differently. At 10 watt, the Ally is 90% CPU limited at 10 watts, and it never really unlocks the device's true potential. At the time, my guess was the Ally was funneling power increases into additional CPU clock speed, which in Shadow of the Tomb Raider only improves performance by about 5 FPS between 16 watts and 25 watts. In contrast, that same power range improves the 6800 used performance by 10 FPS. With this one example, it looks like the Ally is dumping resources where it doesn't need them, but is there a better way to test this? I want to introduce you guys to 3 d Mark CPU Profiler. It's designed to run a 3D simulation while minimizing the impact of a GPU's performance. With this benchmark, it runs a series of simulations with different thread counts. Many modern DX12 games typically use around 8 threads, while esports games like CSGO only use between 2 to 4 threads. I like to think of this benchmark comparable to Cinebench, but for gamers. For a baseline, I will run the profiler by itself on the system and collect each run's resulting score. 
After that, I will spawn a GPU-Z render in the background and rerun the same test. These two processes execute at the same time on their respective device, forcing a resource contention on the handheld. Collecting the resulting scores for each thread count will show us how the ROG Ally and the ANEO Geek balance their systems as a whole. Let's start at 10 watts. In blue, we have the original Firmware 321 with the ROG Ally, followed by the latest update with Firmware 323. In red, we have the ANEO Geek running the stock 6800U APU. Fully loaded with 16 and 8 threads, the Z1 Extreme in the Ally performs better than the 6800U, as we would expect. But as we decrease the load on the processor, the 6800U picks up some steam, matching the ROG Ally in most tests. The critical takeaway is that the blue and green lines for the ROG Ally are within the margin of error. However, turning on the GPU workload drops our performance across the board. However, we don't see the ROG Ally with the 321 firmware drop nearly as much with the newer 323. In fact, the Z1 Extreme with the 323 firmware performs even worse than the 6800U in many instances. Dialing in my recommended mode for the Ally, 15 watts, again shows a dramatic shift between the two firmware versions. The profiler alone sees 16, 8, and 4 thread performance drop for the Ally, though the 6800U only performs better with the higher count applications. In the CPU plus GPU workload though, we see very similar behavior as our 10 watt example. However, our 4 thread result now lines up with the 6800U. 25 watts is not a setting I recommend for handheld use, but if you're using your Ally in docked mode, the new firmware will shake up some changes here too. Unsurprisingly, when just running the CPU loads, we see no real improvement between the Ally's firmware versions, and the 6800U actually performs very similarly to the Ally. Switching gears to the combined workload, the Z1 Extreme with the 323 firmware now soundly beats the 6800U in all instances except the 16 thread run, which really isn't indicative of real world gameplay. Now, you might be scratching your head thinking, wait, a lower performance number here is a good thing? <laughs> yes, actually yes, particularly with the CPU plus GPU scenario. Here we have the ROG Ally running at 20 watts in the 8-thread CPU plus GPU condition, all while running the 321 firmware. The blue line is our average CPU core clock speed. We hit a stable 3250 MHz throughout the run, far from our advertised 5 point something GHz boost clock. But look at that orange line. That's the GPU clock speed. Even at 20 watt, the old firmware has us pegged at 800 MHz, even while running our GPU workload. Now let's look at the Geek with the 6800U. Over the same time period, though we are looking at more test samples, our CPU clock hovers around 2000 MHz, 1.25 GHz lower than the Ally. But the key benefit is with the orange line. The 6800U's GPU runs around 1500 MHz, almost twice as fast as the Z1 Extreme. I even see this same behavior with a 4-thread workload as well. So what exactly does this mean for the 323 firmware? ASUS is finally tweaking away from a CPU-focused performance mindset and is shifting to a more balanced system approach. This shift translates into the lower profiler scores we witnessed before, but it enables higher clock speeds for our RDNA 3 780M graphic solution. This improved balance should translate into better GPU performance when put into the right conditions. Synthetics are one thing, but how does this pan out with real-world gaming benchmarks? I've taken my original ROG Ally data and retested 9 games that hammer the CPU, GPU, and memory quite differently. I'm going to focus on 720p performance, as that's the sweet spot for a render resolution for modern PC handhelds. And since we see a dramatic change in scores across all three operating modes, I'll be testing each of those as well. That's over 50 test passes for games and 20 for synthetics, so hit subscribe to support the channel. I've got something huge planned once I hit 10,000 subs, so help a fellow PC nerd out. At 10 watt, the Z1 Extreme is still warming up. However, we find playable frame rates across the board, except Horizon Zero Dawn and Cyberpunk 2077. We actually see slight performance drops in CSGO, Forza Horizon 4, Borderlands 3, and Cyberpunk. 
but performance improves in GTA 5, Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and Horizon Zero Dawn. Granted, the performance delta is less than 10% in most cases, but it's good to see a change nonetheless. At 15 watt, we finally catch our sweet spot for handheld gaming and see sizable improvements overall. Compared to the 319 firmware, 323 sees improvements in CSGO, Forza Horizon 4 and 5, GTA 5, Tomb Raider, and Horizon Zero Dawn. Again, the improvements are good, but they're just not as noticeable as we would like. Regardless, this is a promising start. Moving into dock mode with 25 watts, that extra wattage comes with extra performance, and ASUS's update finally starts to stretch its legs. CSGO is off the charts somewhere around 150 FPS, we cap out our monitor's refresh rate in Forza Horizon 4, we break the 60 FPS threshold in Far Cry 6, and Horizon Zero Dawn. Some of the other games see between 5 and 15% improvement as well. Not too shabby. With data in hand, ASUS is on the right track with the Ally. The 323 firmware is a positive step in optimizing GPU performance while keeping gas in the tank for CPU clock speed when necessary. However, this update alone isn't enough for ASUS to take a break. The Ally still needs more optimization. Headroom is still available in the processor for more performance, ASUS just needs to unlock it. So ASUS, if you're watching this video, here are three things you can do to make this device awesome. First, let us turn off four CPU cores. Not park or sleep, but actually turn them off. At these resolutions, those four cores are just spinning their gears. At 15 watts, each core can consume nearly 1.5 watts of power, so that could easily unlock almost 3 watts of power we can funnel over to the GPU. Combine that with improved boost clock speeds, and that's just a win-win. Second, figure out what's holding back 10 watt mode. With the 40 watt hour battery, 10 watt really is that sweet spot to hit 2 hours of playtime. It might not bump us up to 60 FPS in the games I'm testing, but it can get us up to a locked 30 FPS, which would work even better with the impressive VRR display as well as black screen insertion. Last, just keep on optimizing your device. As we saw with the Steam Deck, with time, we should get up to our proper performance expectations. If history proves itself just like with the Steam Deck, I have no doubt that the ROG Ally can finally hit its performance targets, and as we've seen in this video, the changes with the 323 firmware update are making it good, but it can be better. Look to some of the other gaming handhelds with the 6800U and the 7840U hardware to see where the Z1 Extreme falls flat and approve upon those voltage and frequency tables. As for optimizations, there could be better EPP, max clock speed, and other Windows-enabled settings that you can utilize to improve things further, and Armory Crate is a great place to enable that. Overall, I still love the ROG Ally, and I wish I could play on it more. Hopefully, with an updated graphics driver, I can finally try out Ratchet & Clank and Remnant 2 in the coming weeks. And that's all I have to say about firmware 323 with the ROG Ally. Let me know down in the comments what kind of performance improvement you've seen with this firmware update. And I just want to say sorry to you guys that I haven't gotten videos out these past few weeks. It has been super busy this summer and hopefully with school catching up in a couple weeks, we'll start getting to a more regular schedule. But other than that, I appreciate you guys sticking to the end of the video. I hope you've enjoyed it. Catch me over on Twitter at the Turk and I'll catch you guys in the next one. Later.